Without further ado, I will introduce our speaker, Markham Hislop. He's been to SACPA a few times before, and a lot of people don't want to hear what do you have to say uh, higher up in our government, but uh, wish you like listening to him, and uh, at least myself, I really like listening to him. <laughs> so uh, he's going to be talking a little bit about how ethical Alberta oil and gas is. Uh, please give him a wa warm welcome, Markham Hislop. Thank you. That's good. Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, thank you very much for having me back. I think the last time I was here was 2019, when I, when I was uh, promoting my book, The New Alberta Advantage, Technology Policy and the Future of the Oil Sands. So it's good to see you again, especially after the pandemic. Um, we're going to be talking, we're actually not going to be talking about how ethical Alberta's oil and gas is. We're going to be talking about how unethical it is. So to get us started, I want to talk a little bit about how I, why I did this as a journalist, uh, undertook this project. We're doing a multi-part investigative series on Alberta oil and gas through the lens of the Alberta Energy Regulator. And so I got a couple questions for you before we get started. Who here is familiar with the ethical oil narrative? That Alberta's oil is green, that it's most ethical in the world. Right? Everybody's kind of heard that. Who here believes that Alberta's oil is the most ethical, <laughs> green, clean, and responsibly produced? No hands? No, no one brave enough to, to put up their hand? Well, I'm, I'm a, a bit of an interest, uh, different journalist in the sort of, there are only about 10 or 15 energy journalists left in Canada. There aren't very many of us. But I'm the only one that does global energy transition work also with Alberta oil and gas work because the energy transition is going to affect demand for Alberta oil and gas in the not too distant future. And so I look at what's going on globally. How does it affect Alberta? And so I'm plugged into this. I'm always you know, interviewing experts about Alberta, writing and, and doing interviews about it. And over the course of you know, the last four or five years, I will occasionally interview uh, somebody about an Alberta energy regulator issue. Could be the oil sands, could be conventional oil and gas. It might be uh, lawyer uh, Drew Uchuk. It might have been Reagan Boychuk from the Polluter Pay Federation. But I would do one every two, three months. Just enough to know that there were lots and lots of problems. And then, of course, in the, cor you know, in the course of my regular reporting, I knew that there were lots and lots of problems. The problem is that it is such a big issue, it's so technically complex, that it's very, very difficult to get your arms around it and then explain it to an audience of general readers. It's very difficult. I had no idea. I had no idea what I was getting into and how difficult it was. But in February of this year, you probably, everybody here will know about the, the leak uh, that was discovered. Actually, there was a leak and a spill. But up at Curl, uh, Imperial Oil's Curl Oil Sands plant, there was a big spill of 5.3 uh, million liters of wastewater. And then at the same time, the AAR had to, and the company had to fess up that there had actually been a leak uh, onto the surface of contaminated toxic uh, uh, wastewater as well that they hadn't told anybody about. And now they had to come up, come clean. And of course, you can imagine the indigenous communities were really upset. And it was, it was a huge issue. They called the, the regulator and the company before the House of Commons Environmental Committee, on and on and on. It's been a big, it's been a, it was, was one of the biggest oil sands issues of the past four or five years, for sure. When that happened, I said, OK, this is clearly, it's time I have to jump into this story, and I have to do it my way. And my way means going deep, deep, deep into the science and the technology and, and, and how the regulator works and all of that. Going, so getting right into the meat of it and then coming back up and explaining it in a way that the average Albertan can understand. So I have interviewed 
that's, we're on to part three now, which is about the oil sands. Part one set out the general argument for unethical oil. Part two was about conventional oil and gas. And now I'm doing part three, which is about the oil sands on mining. Because the mining part of it and the in situ uh, steam assisted gravity drainage, SAG D, is, they're two very different industries. So I'm going to treat them separately. But I've interviewed, I think for part two, I interviewed over 50 experts, scientists, economists, people who worked at the AER. I'm probably now up to 25 or 30. Uh, I, I, if I never interview another tailings pond scientist in my life, it will be too early. I can tell you all about naphthanic acids and F2 hydrocarbons, blah, blah, blah. But nevertheless, this is the work that has to be done in order for us to properly understand what's going on. As bad as I thought it was when I started, once I got deep into it, I realized how bad it really is. The government and the industry have been lying to you for decades. This not only is Alberta oil not ethical, it is deliberately unethical. And there are currently $300 billion of unfunded environmental liabilities. I'm talking orphan wells and tailings ponds that they don't know how to, how to reclaim, and on and on and on. $300 billion of unfunded liabilities. And in my opinion, based on my reporting so far, I don't think the industry has any intention whatsoever of paying that bill. So one of three things is going to happen. Either it's going to be a financial disaster, a catastrophe for the people of Alberta, you and your children and your grandchildren, or it's going to be an environmental catastrophe, or the doomsday scenario, a financial and an environmental catastrophe. And that's how bad this is. And who, can anybody think of any journalist in the last in recent memory? who has done this kind of work and has this kind of message? Oh, no, we can't. Nick Aforic would be the closest. But Andrew, Andrew hasn't even scratched the surface. And I admire his work, don't get me wrong. But, this, but that's as close as you come. And in Alberta, who listens to Who was I talking to? Dave uh, Beers, who is Andrew's publisher. And he said, poor Andrew, he can't, he can't even go out for lunch in Alberta. He's so disliked here. You guys like it. <laughs> I know. I thought as much. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a problem communicating the extent and the magnitude of this issue is a real difficult because there is a narrative machine run by the industry, promoted now by this, this particular government and by many, uh, by many of the, in the business community, a narrative machine to push the ethical oil narrative. And if you're the average, like my, I have my son-in-law who lives in, in, um, in Calgary. He's 40 years old. He's got an engineering degree, smart, smart guy. But all he hears is the narrative. He hears the memes, ethical oil, responsible oil, clean oil, green oil. So that's what he knows. And that's what he responds. Nobody goes, tells him a different story based on the evidence. And that's what I want to do with you today. So let's get on to the first... What I'm going to cover in today's presentation is the $300 billion of unfunded oil and gas environmental liabilities. We're going to talk about oil and gas regulation in Alberta, conventional oil and gas production, and then we'll get to the oil sands. And I know Knut said it would be 25 or 30 minutes. Blank, blank, not likely. So buckle, it. buckle up. OK, I wanted to start with this. Because this is an estimate that the Alberta Energy Regulator did not publish. In 2015 or 2016, they started what was called Directive 11. And they directed a fellow named Robert Wadsworth, he was the VP of something or other, to do an estimate, and bring an up-to-date estimate, on what the unfunded liabilities were. Because the official estimates were really low. So he did that. His team did that. And then, we would never have known, but he gave a couple of presentations, and somebody leaked the PowerPoint to the National Observer. Had that not happened, we would never know. So here's what Wadsworth team came up with. On the mining side of the oil sands, $130 billion of unfunded liabilities. 
On the conventional oil and gas, and they treat in situ, which is SAG-D, the same, because the production processes are reasonably close, $100 billion. Pipelines, there are 440,000 kilometers of provincially regulated pipelines in Alberta. $30 billion. So there's $260 billion by the AER's own unofficial estimates. Now, as soon as this became public, they, the AER immediately disavowed it and pretended it was $30 billion or something, which everybody laughed at and nobody believed for a moment. And then Wadsworth, Wadsworth got his walking papers. Anybody surprised? <laughs> and, but what's not on there? Well, for starters, there's 90,000 oil and gas facilities in this province. Only 4% of them are reclaimed. That's not reflected in these numbers. Inflation is not reflected in these numbers. The fact that, that nowhere on the planet has anybody ever reclaimed 28 tailings ponds with 1.7 trillion liters of toxic fluid in them, particularly in a, a sensitive northern environment and ecosystem like we have in northern Alberta. So when they say $130 billion, they just pulled out of thin air, not quite out of thin air, but as An Dr. Andrew Sobolewski told me, who he works in tailings ponds all over the world, he says Albania has better regulations than we do in this stuff. And they are required to put in a reclamation program before they start producing, not at some vague point down the road when you know, kind of get around to it. And so these numbers, I'm convinced, there's no reason we should be optimistic. There's no reason we should let them say it's less than this. You're the taxpayer. It's likely going to come back on you. We should be skeptical of these numbers. And we should assume that the costs will be greater. Right? Trans Mountain expansion, it was going to be $5.7 billion. And now it's 15 or 18 or billion or whatever it is. Big projects always have cost inflation. So this could be 400 billion, it could be 500 billion. But it's not less than 300 billion in my opinion. Okay, polluter pays principle. If you pollute, you pay to clean it up. It's the mainstay of environmental law everywhere. Not just in Alberta, everywhere. When should the polluter pay? Now this is, this is the key principal thing. If you remember nothing else about this presentation, remember that the question of where you take security, when you make the company put money against their future environmental liabilities, is the key to understanding why Alberta has failed. And I'll explain just in a minute. Where are we here? Another document that was FOIPed, and this comes from 2019, and it was the Narwhal that FOIPed it. It's called the Liability Narrative. And the AER, it was for internal use only, and it went over all sorts of issues that are problematic. It was pages and pages long. But this is a great quote. Managing end-of-life obligations and insolvency is too late in the life cycle. <laughs> Duh! When the company's bankrupt, is not, you're not going to squeeze any money out of them to reclaim their wells or their tailing spots. That's what we've been doing. When this industry got started 100 and some years ago, it was small, but when it got started, there were four principles that underlaid the strategy that Alberta has pursued ever since. Industry profitability expansion, number one. Capital attraction, number two. Job creation, number three. Government revenue, number four. You notice that environmental liabilities is not in this list? And if it was, it would be way down the list. But I should point out that Alberta is no different than any jurisdiction in the United States. They've got over... 1.4 million orphan wells between all the various states. 
And while the states put in things like uh, surety bonds and security at the beginning of uh, a well's life, it was such a small pittance that it didn't make any difference. There was essentially, for all intents and purposes, no money to reclaim those wells when the time came. So every other oil and gas jurisdiction in, in North America, pretty much, is in the same boat as Alberta. Alberta is not that unique. It's just still, st I hope it probably doesn't make you feel any better because it's still your wallet that's on the line. The oil companies, now, when, when they, uh, you know, in the early days, they took a little tiny bit of security. And then they decided not, they decided to do away with that in 1986. And then in the 90s, they came out with a, a new liability management program that was an utter disaster. An utter disaster. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But now if we have $300 billion worth of environmental uh, liabilities, only one billion of security has ever been collected. One three hundredth of what is required. How do CEOs think about liability? This was an absolute revelation for me. And I, I first found it when I discovered it when I interviewed um, Dr. Uh, Dan Wicklum, who was head of the C Canadian Oil Sand Innovation Alliance uh, from 2012 to 2019. So he was sitting at the table with CEOs every day oil sand CEOs, if you and I have a liability, if I have a liability, it's a debt. I have to pay that liability, right? Well, that's not the way the, the oil and gas companies think of it. Every year when they allocate capital, so the production guys, the well, completion well, well guys come to the table, and the, the um, uh, drillers come to the table, all the parts of the company come to the table with budgets, and the CEOs look to, the management looks to allocate capital, they evaluate liabilities the same way they do revenue generating projects. So if a project can't pay for itself, if there's not a net positive return on the capital that's spent, they won't do it. How do you reclaim orphan wells and make money on that? It's impossible. It is literally just you can't do it. It costs you money to do it, and therefore it's a net negative. And so they go, well, okay, we're not going to do it then. We're going to put our money somewhere else where we can make a better return on it. And I've had that confirmed with, I've had that confirmed with uh, Will Popoff, who is actually, uh, he works as a consultant on liability management. He said, yes, that's exactly the way they think about it. They're changing now, he said. A wonderful, 100 years after the industry got founded, the industry is changing a little bit. Would have been nice if you'd done it a little earlier. Nevertheless, so where companies allocate capital tells you a lot about what their priorities are and how they think about liabilities. And here's another point. Industry has shirked at this res liabilities responsibility for 100 years. And there's a great quote, and I quoted it at length in the presentation later on, because I want you to get an insight into how the regulator thinks about the oil companies. The regulator is captured. That means that it puts, it confuses, it prioritizes the industry interest before the public interest, before your interest. That's a captured regulator. And outside of Alberta, there are all kinds of scholars of this sort of thing who talk about how Alberta is the most captured regulator. And not only that, it was designed from the very beginning to be a captured regulator. This is not by accident, folks. The regulator was set up to serve the interests of industry, not the other way around. In fact, I'll tell you a little story after I have a glass, just a sip of water. I had to grant anonymity to a former AER manager. He's not at the executive, or wasn't at the executive level, he was one below. And so one day, uh, his executive couldn't make it to a meeting with oil companies. So they sent him instead. And so the AR executives are all sitting around there. And this is his story, his words. And the oil company guys walk in. And remember, the AER's entire budget is paid by the oil industry. It's not paid out of government funds. It's paid by the people it regulates. 
Imagine that. So according to my source, and I had to grant him anonymity because he was still working in the industry and he would never have worked again if I'd used his name. He said, the oil guys sat down in front, it was probably Cap was one of them and maybe some C, who, who knows. And one of them looked over at the executives and went, we pay for you, we own you, you will do exactly what we tell you to do. Now, I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing, that's what he told me. I've got it recorded, that's an on the record interview. That's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Now, it doesn't operate, it's not always that overt. It's not always the CEOs bossing around Lori Pusher, the CEO, and all the executives and telling them what to do. It's much more subtle than that in many ways. And in many ways, the regulator does its best, given the resources it has, and the political environment and the policy environment in which it works. This is not the case of, I gave you the ex extreme example of well, how the industry thinks about the regulator, but then on lots of the you know the day-to-day -day stuff, it's not that bad. But overall, there's plenty of evidence that the AR is a captured regulator. So we're going to talk about who pays. I think the taxpayers are going to be on the hook for the whole $300 billion, but here's what they've been paying already. Uh, $235 million to the Orphan Well Association as a loan under the NDP, $100 million under the uh, UCP. The federal government has loaned $200 billion. Uh, this actually might be on the other slide. I'll get to that in a minute. Our star proposal. Dan Daniel Smith last year was an oil and gas industry lobbyist. And she lobbied for the R Star proposal, which is a credit program that provides credit. If you clean up your old wells, you reclaim them, then you get a credit against drilling. So it was it was described as a twenty billion dollar program. In fact, the way the program works, it, the ultimate the, the actual cost to the taxpayer would be between six and twelve billion dollars. So we would be paying the oil companies to do something they are required under law to do. I don't think that seems crazy to any of you. It seems awfully crazy to me. So there was such a public outcry about it that it got shunted over into a, a $110 million pilot project. In a couple of years, the government will decide what it's going to do. You know how that goes. But that's not the worst part of this. The worst part, according to Professor Martin Olashinsky, who's an environmental law professor at the University of Calgary, is moral hazard. If you pay the oil companies a bunch of money to, and you pay for things that they should have paid anyway, you create a precedent. Why should they ever pay again? You'll come to the, back to the table sooner or later. It's the moral hazard argument that is the underpinning evil of that proposal. It's not the specifics of the program, it's not the actual numbers, it's the, it's the moral hazard. The thing that never gets talked about. Nobody quotes Professor, Professor Olashinsky in the Calgary Herald or in the oil, Daily Oil Bulletin, but that's the, that's the key here. You do it once and you're gonna be on the hook for a long time. Right, and here's Canadian taxpayers. So $200 million loan to the Orphan Well Association, and then a billion dollars of COVID-19 funding uh, to clean up old well sites. And then, of course, you know, there's billions that have been set aside for, for carbon capture and storage for the oil sands. On and on and on and on. So <laughs> when the industry says we never get subsidized, you have, this is only a tip of the iceberg. But you can, you can call BS on that. And these have, aside from the, the monetary penalty that taxpayers are like to, likely to pay, you've got leaking wells, you've got polluted water, we've got human health issues, like some of this stuff. There are contamination plumes from old wells underneath the streets of Calgary. The, the old Greyhound, uh, uh, where, the, where the Greyhound bus station is now, I am told by an engineer, uh, used to be a well site. And their uh, contamination plumes from that old site uh, show up two, two kilometers away in testing. Albertans have no idea how much, how much contamination 
is underneath the surface, near their groundwater, near their aquifers, from these old leaking wells. And here's another one, Dwight Popovich, uh, Dwight Popovich is a landowner near uh, Vegreville, uh, Two Hills actually. And uh, he had a well on his land and the company went bankrupt. So it didn't become an orphan well because, I mean, in Al only in Alberta, right? An orphan well is not an orphan well. It's only an orphan well when it's become, it's bec when there's no longer a licensee and the uh, Alberta government transfers the owner, the, that well into the Orphan Well Association inventory. So and we'll get to the numbers in, in just a minute. But what that means is there are a bunch of wells, the tens of thousands of these wells, sitting in limbo. There are for all their de facto orphan wells, and you, with, until they're cleaned up, you can't sell your land. How many thousands of farmers, and nobody knows this answer, but Dwight and the folks who work for the Pluto Pay, Pay Federation think it's like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of farmers can't sell land because they've got a contaminated well on it. And the, and the bank won't loan against land that has a contaminated well on it. And now according to uh, according to Dwight, we're even hearing that uh, the, the AER's reclamation certificates have lost so much credibility that even they won't be recognized by the bank. So that means that the landowner has to go and get an environmental assessment for thousands and thousands of dollars before they can sell their land because of somebody else's well on their property. On and on and on. All sorts of implications. <coughs> I wanted to do just quickly, you can have a, a, just a quick look at this, and I'll make the presentation available to anybody who wants it. The first regulator outside of the government started in 1938. So we've been doing this for, what, 85 years? We've had a regulator. And 2013, uh, kind of 2014, is when the Alberta Energy Regulator was created by the PC governments. And I interviewed the minister, energy minister, um, <laughs> King. Uh, I can't remember his first name. He told me some stuff that would curl your hair. You know, things that happened uh, at the time that now uh, he, he bitterly regrets. He understands that it was a mistake. That's the energy minister who was responsible for that legislation. Okay, this is the quote I was telling you about. And this is from, I think it's from Leo Touchette, which is a 1995 internal AER document. The deposit amounts were so small that little protection was afforded against large expenditures where a licensee did not exist or was not able to meet his responsibilities. In other words, they just, they were, they were insignificant. They were, uh, had no useful purpose. And increasing the deposit, the deposit to a meaningful amount was not considered feasible. So the industry lobbied the regulator and and said, nope, we're not, we don't want you to, to put ask for security uh, that will approximate the cost of reclaiming that well. But here's where it gets interesting. We as regulators once worked under the assumption that one company would drill wells, construct facilities, and produce and abandon these wells and facilities. It followed, therefore, that rigid and complete adherence to our requirements was not critically important as we knew the company. Now, what this means is they just, they assumed that, that the oil companies were good guys, right? And that when the time came, they would just do their duty. They're, they're, they would do the right thing would ultimately have to reclaim the site, thereby having to absorb any costs related to noncompliance. Key sentence coming up. Over the past years, this assumption has been proven very wrong, with most major operators divesting themselves of projects on the downward slope of profitability. Okay, so this is regulator language. Let me translate that for you. I'm Shell. I'm Imperial. Apparently Imperial was the worst one of the bunch. I've milked everything I can get out of this, this well, this asset. I now, instead of paying the, the many thousands of dollars required to reclaim that well, I'm now going to sell it to a junior company for 
for peanuts, and there, there are evidence actually that some uh, oil companies paid other oil companies to take their environmental liabilities off their hands. I'm going to dump my liability on this small producer. I made all the money off it. They could worry about doing the reclamation. Liability dumping. It was so common for decades. Everybody knew it was going on. The regulator knew it was going on and turned a blind eye. And if you want a, a fun, uh, spend a couple of hours going down a rabbit hole, Google Sequoia Resources and the convoluted business structure that was set up to, to be able to dump uh, liabilities from the major company down to um, a smaller company that eventually went bankrupt. And the owner of that uh, company is married to and is one herself one of the most prominent members of the oil and gas community, business community. This is not shady operators. This is all the operators. Oh, no. Sorry, dude. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, you're going to have to pry me away from the mic. Here's another quote. Currently, industry is not allocating sufficient budget resources to closure activities. Many operators spend the minimum required to meet regulatory compliance for closure, and it is insufficient to keep up with the mounting liabilities, and that is regardless of oil and gas prices. When oil prices are high, they want to make the maximum profit. When oil prices are low, they don't want to spend the money. So basically, they don't do anything. They do the minimum. And remember, these are all, this is quoting from an AER document. I mean, how could you be the regulator, know this was going on, and do nothing to stop it? Talk about abandoning the public interest. OK. So there are all sorts of little wrinkles to this story. And, and this chart shows one. And I know you can't see it very well, because it came out of that liability narrative document. It's been reproduced a few times. It's kind of fuzzy. The orange. Um, the orange uh, bars are wells that have been produced, either gas or oil. The blue bars are wells that have never been produced. They're dry holes. So why are the oil companies reclaiming a lot more dry holes than gas and oil wells? Well, because the dry hole is the cheapest well to reclaim. The next cheapest is, ga is gas. So look where they're spending their money. Look where they're allocating their capital. They're creaming the crop is what they're doing. There's the data right there from the AER. And the AER knows that they're doing it. This is one of the great tragedies of oil and gas regulation, and nobody talks about it. In, 20, uh, in 2000, the AAR brought in, they were trying to get, they knew this was a problem, they were trying to get a handle on it, and they canceled a program that had been working for two years, and they brought in a liability, license liability management ratio program. So basically, if you had, uh, if your assets equaled your uh, liabilities, you got a, a rating of one. If you got below one, you were in trouble, and the AER would come knocking on your door. If you were above one, and then later on they changed it to above two to give people more slack, then you were okay and they didn't, they didn't bother you. The problem is all the little operators spent more time gaming the system to make sure that their LLR, their li licensee liability ratio, was correct and wouldn't get the regulator on their case than they did actually doing reclamation work. And so where that arrow starts going up, to that year 2001. Surprise, surprise. They bring in the new system, and it's a colossal failure. Now, it, it was a colossal failure for 20 years. Oh, and I should mention too, and again, this is complexity and wrinkles in this, there has never been in Alberta, and there is not today, a, require, a timeline requ a, a requirement to close a well and reclaim it within a specified time. You can put a well and you can suspend it and leave it there till Christ comes. 
So if you're an oil company, where's your incentive to reclaim it? There's no penalty for you to do it. Okay. So this shows, what this shows is suspended and inactive wells. Now, you, can, you have a producing well, you have an abandoned well, which means that it's been sealed, so it's been plugged, the bore has been plugged, but not reclaimed. Then you have a reclaimed well where uh, it's sealed and all the, the surface area, like around the well, has been brought back to its original condition. And then you have a suspended and active well, which is basically you plug it and then you just put it aside and you're not producing it anymore. But you don't do anything else with it. Look at the suspended and active wells. By 2020, it got up to 97,000 wells. Out of 464,000 total wells in Alberta, almost 20%, maybe a little over 20%, were just limbo wells, just sitting there. Huge problem. Okay. I, I use this, this is from the spring. It comes from the AER's website. And I like it because I know it's gonna be trouble seeing those numbers and I'll try to, to go through them. So what you have, I'm, I'm having trouble reading. The point here, it, it, this is the, the numbers uh, of the, the kinds of wells I just talked about. And between the um, sealed but not reclaimed, so you still have to do the reclamation work if it's contaminated soil. And the suspended and inactive, which are just plugged and there's nothing else been, been done to them, it's 170,000 wells out of 464. There are only 90,000, I think, that are fully reclaimed. And there's 155,000 still active wells. But 60% of those, 95,000, are what are called marginal producers. They're producing less than 10 barrels a day. They are at the end of their productive life. They will soon either have to be reclaimed, more than likely they'll wind up on the suspended inactive uh, list again. And the, the government brought in some changes in 2020 and then 2022 that have whittled this down a little bit. So now, uh, you see here you'll see 82,000 suspended and inactive, and now it's down to about, about 80,000. But we're at the, that's at the bottom. The, the, none of those wells are going to go back on production um, and like, unlikely to be reclaimed. So, the inc we're getting close to it. The incumbent's dilemma. And uh, this morning, I, I, for uh, Bill Lethbridge, I did a, a presentation on the energy transition, and this is a little part of it. So just assume that the global energy transition, we're shifting over to electricity and low, low emission uh, fuels like hydrogen much, much, much quicker than we, we had expected. In fact, the IEA said that two days ago. Uh, so what happens then is oil and gas business models are being disrupted. Right? Think Blockbuster. Think Eastman Kodak when digital photo photography came in. That's a disruption. So you have, and so we got peak oil demand probably coming this decade. So the companies have two options. They can either pivot to a new business model, and we know that's not happening because we just saw Suncor, uh, the CEO, Rich Kruger, say, we're going back to our knitting. Right? And that's the second thing they can do. They can double down on, on the status quo. Double down, try to drive their costs down, try to become, drive their emissions down to be more competitive. Alberta oil and gas is already disrupted. 49,000 jobs have been lost in the last decade in the oil patch out of 178,000. According to the interviews that I've done, we'll likely lose another 50,000 by 2030. By the time 2030 rolls around, it's likely that we will have less than 50% of the employment in the oil and gas industry that we had in late 2013, early 2014. Less than half. Isn't that the bargain? Isn't that what you signed up for when you let the oil companies uh, exploit the resource? Is that jobs would be created? And in response, in response to low prices, and disruption and technological change, what do they do? They cut costs. They cut, 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 cut to be, to be competitive. So you can already see that the industry is being disrupted. 
Now we'll talk a little bit about eth ethical oil. So Ezra Levant, not my favorite. Uh, anyway, we won't go there. I'll get, I'm going to wind up getting sued. Uh, he wrote the Ethical Oil book in, in 2010. It became actually a bestseller, and he basically argued that because of Canada's um, uh, democracy and its, in its systems of regulation, that that uh, the oil sands were ethical. Since then, it's been. Uh, it's been expanded, ethical oil has been expanded to include environmentally responsible, well-regulated. So in 2013, CAP asked engineering firm Worley Parsons to compare uh, Alberta's regulations to uh, uh, other jurisdictions like Norway and the United States and so on, equivalent kinds of jurisdictions. But what they did, they said, they restricted the terms of reference to only to design, not to performance, right? So Alberta has some of the best legislation and regulations on the planet. Its performance under those regulations is dismal, as I've laid out. You know, and I've given you about, probably about 10% of what I could have today. This is how the narrative gets managed. You will see Worley Parsons quoted all the time by the industry and by the Premier and by Brian Jean, the Energy Minister. We're the best. Worley Parsons said so. <laughs> if only we'd known the full story, right? I want to show you oil and gas GHGs. 80 or 90 percent of them belong to Alberta. Over 200 megatons of emissions per year. Canada's total emissions are 670 megatons. The oil industry accounts for 26% of national greenhouse gas emissions. The oil sands accounts for 11 or 12% of national emissions all by themselves. Does that sound ethical to you? Look at Alberta. 12% of the population 38% of Canada's national emissions. Is it any wonder the federal government wants to implement an oil and gas emissions cap? Look at those other problems. The Premier said only a week or two ago that Alberta's emissions were dropping. There's the data from the Environment, Cli Environment and Climate Change Canada website. I copied it a few days ago. Alberta is the only province whose emissions are rising. That's part of the managing the narrative. We get lied to, they withhold information, they manipulate the data, they manipulate the evidence, and nobody tells you the truth. That's the truth, that's what the data says. And now we come back to what I said at the very beginning. Without government and regulator, regulator action, Alberta is very likely facing an environmental, economic, and financial catastrophe within the next 10 to 20 years, within your lifetimes. I can't stress how serious this is. I could tell you stories about what goes on inside the regulator. I, could tell, I, I, I interviewed a, a contamination engineer. What she told me just about curled my hair. And this just a, that's just, you know, one or two examples. There are dozens and dozens and dozens I could provide. So folks, if, I, if there's any message I want to leave you with, is understand that Alberta's oil is not ethical, it is unethical, and you are being, uh, as you, you are uh, the victims of a well-organized PR and narrative campaign to make you think otherwise. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Let's do the question and answer. We may run a little bit of overtime today. I think uh, I'm okay with that myself. If you have st stuff to do, uh, you feel free to to do it. Um, before I let, turn it over to the next question, I'll ask a question myself. Uh, Markham, do you have you come across any 
corporation has actually done what they're supposed to do over time. Over time. Are you aware of anybody that has actually been, you know, responsible corporate citizens? I, I'm going to say no, uh, but with the caveat that there are companies, since I just haven't run across them yet. And I will say this, and this is something really important to, to keep in mind about the industry, particularly the big companies. The big four companies, Imperial Oil, Sonova, CNRL, and um, Suncor, produce about 70% of all the oil and gas in this province. And then there's some intermediates, uh, you know, maybe a d 10 or a dozen that produce a lot of the rest. So we're talking about a handful of companies. These are companies that are well staffed, they have professional people looking after regulatory compliance, and they make a big deal out of being in compliance with regulation. Right? So the issue here is there's been a whole history of wildcatting, crazy, you know, avoiding regulation in the past. Then the industry consolidated until you got these big giants. I mean, literally, they're you know they're they're majors or super, Canadian super majors, and then it becomes very bureaucratic and and professional. The problem is that how those regulations are interpreted. There's something that uh, Professor Martin Olshinsky was telling me about. He said, in environmental law, the thing you do not want is, the, is the, both the policy and the regulations to allow discretion to the regulator. Discretion will get you, every time, will get you a captured regulator. And Alberta policy and regulation has more discretion built into it than almost any other jurisdiction on the planet. That's how they get away with this stuff, you know, because the, the staff right from the subject matter experts right at the bottom of the, of the org chart right up to the top of the CEO are all entitled to exercise discretion on the application of the regulations, how they're interpreted, how they're applied. So. <laughs> did they follow, did the oil company follow the regulation or not? Maybe not to the letter of law, but as applied by the regulator, yes. So what's clearly needed here is either deep six the AER and start again, or come in and do a major ground, you know, renovation from the ground up and bring in somebody from outside who can actually make this a world-class regulator that it claims to be. Because otherwise, do we have any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I'll just make a point. Um, Go to the mic. Oh. That one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I have. Oh, Bridget Pastor. Um, I have to run, so please excuse me. But um, I have been hearing this for a very long time. And it certainly was in the back rooms. So, you know, I, I, I get frustrated because you know that it's going on, and I think we all know that it's going on, but now we have the data to prove that we know what's going on, and it's quite important. And I think that this knowledge that we just gained here today is also knowledge we, that we should be using to prove that we will not have money in an Alberta pension plan to pay for us. Uh, one of the th points I'd like to make here is that what's, what I've described to you today has occurred under every political party that's been in power. The PCs, the NDP under Rachel Notley, and the UCP under Kenny and, and Danielle Smith are just the worst examples of it. But even, like I interviewed, how do I put this? I interviewed an energy minister who would know, wink, wink, and there is no, was no urgency under that party in that government to fix this. I'm not even sure they understood what the problems were. Now, Bridget, Bridget has said that you know this is no one in the back, back rooms, but talking to this former energy minister, I never got a sense that she really 
you know, had a good handle on it. And I don't think the party, and I don't think the premier had a good handle on it. So this isn't, electing another, a different party, it doesn't fix the problem, I guess is where I'm going with this. We need more than that. And I don't mean it to be a criticism of, you know, the party that I, whose name I haven't mentioned. It's just that this is baked in the cake. It's so deeply ingrained in Alberta's history and Alberta's culture. I, I interviewed uh, Janet Brown, who's a CBC pollster, was polling for CBC, you probably run across her, very, very, very reputable. And she said her polling data shows that well over 50% of Albertans identify so deeply with oil and gas, for all intents and purposes, their identity is oil and gas. And when you attack oil and gas, you attack them. That's how they feel about it. Think about that, over half the people in this province. So changing it is no small matter. It's not just electing another party. There needs to be a wholesale conversation about how serious this is and what some of the options are over and above the industry and the politics. It almost has to take place outside of those venues because otherwise it'll just be the usual lying and weaseling that we've seen for 100 years. We have another question? Hi, my name is Henning Mundel. Um, don't you find it an ultimate irony, the outrage that Daniel Smith and our local MLA, the minister, uh, place on people that are upset at the pause in the green energy programs in the solar and, and uh, uh, wind energy when you have this that has happened for decades and decades and how can they even with a straight face uh, exhibit that kind of an outrage at the opposition to their pause? Excellent question. And I'll note that I, that I did recognize the irony there. Um, but this is the problem. This is, a, you know, the, the premier can get up and put a seven month uh, moratorium on wind and solar development. And now, I guess yesterday in the, at the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce event was talking about how they're, what they're gonna bring in legislation in the spring and there will be security required for reclamation of solar panels and, and wind turbines. And the irony, yeah. <laughs> Yes, there is that irony come to play, to play again. And, and, but the, 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 issue, the, the problem is that how many people recognize the irony? Very few. And this has become, I, I, you know, I hate to come here and tell you all the bad news without offering some suggestions for what we might do to fix it. Right? Otherwise, you know, what we can do is just sink into despair. We need to do something. But the thing that I keep coming back to is w needing to take this conversation outside of the regular channels, when it, by which I mean the industry, the government, and the media, the media, the Alberta media, where we can talk about evidence, not narrative, where we can have these kinds of conversations and maybe build public support for change. Because you know, you and I get a chuckle out of the irony, you know, and roll our eyes and go, oh my God. And she, but most people don't, and she doesn't, and the government clearly doesn't, and the, you know, on and on and on, right? So there has to be something more than that, but yes, irony duly, no, duly noted. But anybody, yeah, Mr. Gibson. Mark, what? To the mic, to the mic. Here. Come on, Al. March up here. I know it's going to be a good question. Your voice might be loud, but then it won't be recorded. I understand. Gotcha. So, hi, Alan Gibson. So my question for Markham is, um, what are the feds able to do and what are they doing to address the overall picture of what you're describing here, because all I see really is a carbon tax and they're building an oil pipeline. So is there anything that they could realistically do, or should we just complain about Justin Trudeau for well longer? <laughs> Another really good question. So 
Under the, uh, under the Canadian Constitution, the provinces have most of the responsibility for regulating natural resource development. And despite what the Premier says, that authority has not really been challenged by this federal government. Uh, that's just a, a smoke screen, a political smoke screen. So think of the industry in two parts. Uh, the first one is conventional oil and gas. It takes place in, uh, inside of Alberta. It's regulated by the, by the province. And there's not much the feds can do here. I'm, I'm sure there are, you know, maybe some, something under the Fisheries Act or some obscure act where they might have something they can do. And of course, uh, I take that back because they can bring in an oil and gas emissions cap, which would affect the, the conventional production as well as the oil sands. But where the feds have the most authority, uh, shared authority with the province is under the Fisheries Act. And so when the, uh, one of the things that the, the government did is the ECC stepped in and started an investigation of Imperial uh, to see if they had contaminated any water bodies in northern Alberta and if any fish were, were affected. Then Minister Stephen Gobel, the Environment Minister, convened a working group with the province, the companies, the federal government and indigenous communities to try to work out some way to come up with an idea on how to reclaim tailing spawns and on and on. But this is also a government that, and I know this is, this is not a popular opinion in Alberta, but this is a government that very often, well more often than not, refuse to exercise federal authorities when it comes to disputes with Alberta. You see them backing down over and over and over again. You know, the, the provincial government will put up a stink about the clean fuel standard or the clean electricity regulations or the oil and gas emissions cap or the industrial emitters tax, carbon tax, and on and on and on it goes. And they bellow when they take out ads in Ontario and do all that stuff. And then at the end of it, the federal government backs off. They either give more time for consultation or they, they keep trying to come back as if this was the politics of 40 years ago, 30 years ago, when that, that's how provinces worked. Well, that's not the, the strategy anymore. You know, it's this constant big lie stuff to keep the federal government back on its heels. So Al, the question, the, the answer is they don't have much except under the Fisheries Act uh, in Northern Alberta connected to the, oh, I take it back. Uh, they do have some on major project under the Environmental Assessment Act, which of course parts of it were, there was a reference case to the Supreme Court recently. So that's kind of, some of that is, is maybe open to uh, challenge. Uh, so, but they do, they, they are jointly uh, reviewing some major projects like oil sands and pipelines and, and that sort of thing. It's not very much. And in my opinion, it's not nearly, they don't have nearly the authority required to fix the mess at the Alberta Energy Regulator. So I think the feds, I, I, don't, I don't hold out much hope. Uh, they're not going to be the white knight in shining armor, I'm afraid. Thank you, Mark, and we uh, will entertain two more quick questions and two more quick answers. <laughs> Gail McMartin, I'm just curious, the world is a pretty small place, and will there be pressure brought to bear on Canada, specifically Alberta, uh, regarding the bad practice that we have? and? Um, Comment, please, on on uh, how long we really need oil and gas, because again, the narrative here is that it'll be forever, and we know that other countries um, have already transitioned to some extent. Could you comment on the extent and where these jurisdictions are? Yeah. That was a great question, right up my alley. Uh, on the energy transition side. So the IEA came out Tuesday and released its uh, World Energy Outlook 2023 and said that we are probably looking at peak oil demand uh, sooner than 2030. And there are folks who argue that we've already hit peak oil demand and that we will, that peak demand is usually followed by a plateau you know, where you kind of bump along at the same level, then followed by a decline. So we might have, we might, we might be into 
uh, decline in the, in the global oil markets as early as 2030, probably 20. 30s, early 2030s would be my guess. Might be later, might be earlier. So that, uh, and so your, your question was, what can we, we what, can, what options do we have to fix this, right? And what other well, and, and, and will there be pressure from outside ah, right, right. To, to get on with it? Right. Because of the world is in a pretty small place. We're, we're affecting other people. Yeah, there's not going to be any pressure. No, I, we haven't seen any so far, and I don't. The only pressure that, that comes is in the form of climate policy. So, you know, the, Gilbo or Trudeau go off to a COP, and they make pronouncements like two years ago. They said there was going to be an oil and gas emissions cap immediately, and here we are two and a half, two years later, and there's nothing, that kind of stuff. The, the market, there is a chance that the market will begin to price carbon price emissions intensity. And Alberta has some of the highest emissions intensity oil on the planet. Some of it's up to 140 uh, kilograms of uh, CO2 equivalent per barrel. That's uh, there's not very many grades of oil that are like that. That, and so, because you, you see in, the, in, the, in Europe, right, they've got the carbon border adjustment mechanism. That's designed to do that, to capture carbon intensive goods and tax them as they come in. So Trudeau and, and Biden have talked about doing that in North America. If that happened, then Alberta uh, oil sands, a heavy crude, would be severely disadvantaged. But I wouldn't be surprised if they got around that. Um, but oil per se, and this is true of gas, is only sold on the basis of grade and price. Not, and unless the market comes up with some way to price emissions intensity, that doesn't count. The regulatory environment and all the environmental damage that is done in the extraction of that oil and the shipping of that oil, none of that is taken into account. And I would be very skeptical that we will see a pressure coming from those areas for change. Mary Shellington, um, I was interested to hear that farmers could not sell their land as long as there was a, um, an act of well. Uh, so farmers have united in different ways over the centuries, and, and I'm wondering if you know of any activity that farmers are uniting together in Alberta to uh, put some pressure on about that, that kind of an issue. In, in fact, there is. Uh, you can Google the Polluter Pay Fo uh, Federation in Alberta, uh, and Dwight Popovich is a member, and other people like Mark Doran, who is a I've been an expert I've leaned on a lot, uh, is part of that as well. Uh, and in fairness to the to uh, Danielle Smith and her government, in 2020 they brought in a new uh, liabilities framework management. A management framework, and then last year they brought in the uh, mandatory spend requirement for reclamation. So, you know, the credit where credit's due. It's not nearly enough, but it's more than's ever been done before. So, um, and under that program, there's a certain amount of money that's allocated for farmers can nominate wells, landowners can nominate wells. Like Dwight can go to, to the whatever board is handling the application and can say, here are my circumstances, I would like to nominate my well to be, f to be uh, reclaimed under this program. And it's been fairly popular with farmers and landowners to date. The problem is it's not big enough. There's, it, it, there's way more uh, problem wells than there are uh, nominations and money available to reclaim. But, you know, they, 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 are, they do advocate, farmers and landowners do advocate through their various, through some organizations, but, um, you know, as always, what gets done to try to fix the problem is inadequate. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much for having me. The la I, used to, I used to live in Tabor for a little while, and in 1978-79, every Saturday we came to Lethbridge to the discos. So anyway, I probably met some of you there.